After many, many hours, we finally have the Platinum Trophy in Dragon Ball Z Kakarot for finishing every single achievement in the game. Which as always means, it is time for things I wish I knew earlier. And this is another one of those games with so many tips and tricks and cool things I didn't realize until like late game or even post game, so I actually had to narrow them down and make the list shorter. Anyway, let's not waste any more time and jump straight into it. Now as you guys know, in this series I really try my best to make sure I'm not just sharing the same tips that you're either going to find out in the first 10 minutes of the game, or that you've already seen in 20,000 other videos here on YouTube. And the reason I'm explaining this is because this first tip is actually going to be an exception to the rule, and it is something you've probably seen in many many places already, however it's really important, which is make sure you do the submissions, which are the blue side quest markers that show up, as soon as they show up on your map. Between every mission, quickly check the world map, see if there's any submissions going around, and then immediately go and do it. Usually they're pretty quick, you can get them done in a couple of minutes. Some of them do go on for a little bit longer, but the reason these are so important is because this is how you get most of the soul emblems, which are the things you put into the community boards to actually rank them up. Now again, this is something you will figure out pretty quickly, however by the time you figure it out it might be a little bit too late and you might have already missed out on a few of them, because they are missable, usually after one or two story missions these will disappear and you won't be able to do them again throughout the rest of the game, which means you'll potentially miss out on a lot of soul emblems throughout your playthrough, even if you realize this quite early. Though I guess once you're in post game you can use the time machine to go back and click them afterwards, but really once you're in post game they're not that necessary, I mean it's cool to have them playing through the game. Anyway, moving on to the first real tip is the best method to farm pretty much anything in the game. Personally, I use it for farming Seni, which is the currency, which we'll explain in just a second, but the method consists of going into any of these caves that you can break down, or really any mineral spot in general, preferably an area with at least three to four of these crystals to destroy. Destroy all of them to get stuff like gold and crystals and stuff like that, which you can sell for a ton of money. Then all we need to do is save the game, then load the same save file, and we'll spawn in the same place, but all of the stuff around us will have respawned. So now we can destroy the things again and simply rinse and repeat. And like we said before, you can sell these at a pretty high price, especially if you have a well put together adult community on your community boards, you can actually get a ton of money really, really quickly. And if you're in post game, the best method is actually find all seven of the Dragon Balls, summon Shenron, use one of the wishes to get rich. And if you're in post game, it'll actually give you 100,000 Seni, which is a ton of money. Early on in the game, it will give you like 30,000, then a bit later on, I think it's like 60 or 80,000. And then in post game, it's 100,000. But as we know, the Dragon Balls need 20 minutes real life time to respawn, so in those 20 minutes while you're waiting, you can simply use this method to stack up on stuff to sell, and then once you sell them, find the Dragon Balls again and rinse and repeat. Next up, something that's not really that important, but it's more of a pet peeve of mine, when you're casually flying through the air, just collecting all of these orbs, and then you get these big rings of orbs that you can't really fly through and get all of them at once, so you find yourself turning around to pick up the final one or the ones you leave behind, and honestly it's not worth the time it takes to actually turn around and grab them. And though you don't need every orb in the game, if I do fly through one of these circles and only collect like half of them, I feel really uncomfortable if I don't go back and collect the other half as well. And luckily I found a solution to this, which is press the triangle button, or I'm guessing the Y button on Xbox, and you'll do a barrel roll, and this will actually collect every single orb in these big circles. That is what the barrel roll is intended to do. Now when it comes to temporary buffs in video games, especially JRPGs, I've never really been a big fan. I prefer to know my characters are powerful enough without the need of like temporary boosts. In this case, the cooking mechanic, which is something I didn't really pay too much attention to for the reasons I just mentioned. However, there's something really, really helpful in the cooking mechanic in this game. Foods on this game have two separate types of buffs. The first one up here are the regular temporary buffs we get by consuming that food. However, below that there's another section that's called stat boost. Now it's kind of deceiving because it doesn't actually say this specifically, but the stat boost are actually permanent, as in if in the stat boost section it says plus 10,000 health points, and you consume that meal, all of your characters will permanently have plus 10,000 health points for the rest of the game. And it's one of the best ways to become more powerful that really gets overlooked a lot, especially in early game. And like I said, it affects all of your characters, not just the character that actually consumes that food. Now, it wouldn't be a Dragon Ball Z tips video if we didn't talk about the combat. The first thing I didn't realize about combat in this game is that there's actually different ways you can end off the melee spam, let's call it, when you're just smashing away the circle button. You do a lot of hits and then eventually you'll knock them away. But something I realized pretty late on in the game is that at the end of this melee spam, you can actually end the combo in two other ways. If at the end of the combo you press square for the key blast, it'll actually do a key blast attack to knock them away instead of a physical attack, which isn't too impressive. However, if you press triangle at the end of the combo, things get a little bit more interesting. You'll do this AOE sort of expansion wave around you, which also knocks them back, but it actually recharges a decent amount of your key instantly. And if you're relatively new to the game, you may think, well, that's not really that impressive. However, at risk of moving into a little bit more advanced combat tactics here, 
The reason this is so important, especially if for example you're in Super Saiyan, when your key bar reaches zero, your Super Saiyan transformation is over and you get reverted back to your base form. So if you're in the middle of a combo and realize your key is getting really low and you're about to lose your Super Saiyan transformation, you can quickly tap the triangle button at the end of the combo, you'll be able to knock them away as well as still keeping your Super Saiyan mode activated. And even without Super Saiyan mode, let's say you're in a similar situation when you're in the middle of a combo and you're running really low on key. Well this is another really good use for this, you can press the triangle button, knock them away and get enough key back to follow it up with some sort of a super attack. Quick side note, I'm sure most of you already do this if you've been playing games for a while, but make sure with all of your characters you put the same type of attacks on the same shortcut button. For example, stuff like the Kamehameha Wave, Masenko, or the Gallic Gun. I have all of those equipped to Triangle because they're all the same style of attack. They're all like a beam attack, right? And then my melee super attacks with all of my characters, I have them on Circle. And then when they're the sort of the tracking, multiple key blast, I have them on the X button. That way all of my characters have similar attacks on the same buttons, so it doesn't get confusing and I know exactly what I'm doing and it's sort of more intuitive whichever character I'm using. Next thing we're going to be talking about in the combat category is going to be Surge Mode. Now pretty much everyone knows how to activate Surge Mode and probably use it pretty oftenly anyway. Because you get this pretty much from the beginning of the game, all you need to do is hold down the triangle button when both your key and your tension gauge are fully charged up and it'll put you into this special Surge Mode. The thing is not many people actually use the benefits of Surge Mode to their full extent or don't really even understand the buffs this gives you. Because apart from actually boosting all of your stats, it does a few other cool things, like it allows you to cancel your super attacks halfway through in case you need to dodge. And the two most important things about Surge Mode that if you learn how to do them properly can be really, really powerful is that it auto chases the enemy after knocking them back or if you're going to do another super attack and it also allows you to spam some of your super attacks such as Masenko or any of the beam attacks for that matter. And why is this useful you may ask? Well just check out a few of the clips. So combining Super Saiyan with the Surge Mode and then just really spam away something like Masenko or Kamehameha and as we have Auto Chase activated in Surge Mode it will keep on spawning right next to the enemy and spamming away another one and another one until you run out of key or your Surge Mode runs out. Like even against bosses you can clear some of them out extremely quickly in this method. I will admit it's a bit cheesy and it doesn't work every single time. There are some bosses that do a good job of escaping from this, like they'll hit you at really close range to knock you back and just like block the attacks and stuff. But honestly it worked more often than I was expecting it to. It works especially well with Vegeta's big bang attack. And that's all I'm going to mention on this topic. You guys can go and try it out for yourselves if you're interested. Now another quick thing that I probably wouldn't have used anyway, but... Did you guys know you can run away from random battles in this game? Like if you have an encounter with these enemies flying around, you can actually click down the right analog stick to unlock from the enemies, and then boost fly in the opposite direction, and you'll eventually actually escape the battle. And I generally feel this wasn't explained in any of the tutorials at the beginning of the game. Though then again, maybe it did. Unfortunately, this game doesn't do a great job when it comes to tutorials. At the beginning of the game, it pretty much just gives you 20,000 pop-ups with all the information, and when you're bombarded with that much information that quickly, honestly, hardly any of it really sticks until you kind of figure it out by yourself as you play on. So in Dragon Ball Z Kakarot, like we mentioned before, there's actually many different ways of making your characters more powerful, whether it be by leveling up, by the community boards, by eating foods, by unlocking new super attacks, by the training grounds, so many different ways of making your characters more powerful. However, there's one that gets overlooked quite a bit and is actually the place you can learn some of the most insane stuff. And I'm talking about the training room. It's not a secret by any means, the game explains it to you once you get to the second episode of the Android arc. You gain access to the training room. I never really bothered upgrading it until I was already in post game. And I was really surprised to see how insane some of the passive abilities are that you can unlock through the training room. Even some of the relatively lower level ones, like recommended level 50, you can obviously do this on a lower level than 50, you don't need to be the recommended level. You gain 20% damage to every enemy that's a lower level than you, which is pretty much everything most of the way through the game, except some of the bosses maybe. And what's insane is it's not really just 20%, because once we unlock it, we can go into our super attack palette. We can upgrade this to 30%, and then once more up to 40% extra damage. That's 40% extra damage just out of one passive ability. And up here we have another one that's another 40%, that's already 80%, that's almost double damage just out of these two abilities alone, and they're both out of the training room. Something else about passive abilities in this game, by the way, is you actually need to equip them. So go into the same menu as where you'd equip your super attacks, and then press R1 and you have this other section here called the know-hows. And this is where you're going to be equipped in all of your actual passive abilities. If they're not equipped, they're not going to be taking effect, obviously. So make sure you do this if you haven't already. And we've not quite finished fanboying over the training room quite yet, given this is really, really late game and it's just more for a bit of fun or post-game content. But the final ability you unlock here is called Auto Super Saiyan and this thing is absolutely insane. It is by far the best ability in the entire game in my opinion. What it allows you to do is start the battle in Super Saiyan form. Not only do you start in Super Saiyan, but you also don't consume key while being in Super Saiyan. You heard that correct. 
And if that wasn't enough, if your support characters can also transform, they will also automatically transform at the start of the fight with you. Even if you only have this on level 1, so your character will only start on Super Saiyan 1, your companions will go straight to their max transformation possible. And then if you get all the way to level 120, you can actually start in like Super Saiyan 3 or Gohan's ultimate version and stuff like that, which is absolutely ridiculous and you can stay there the entire fight because it doesn't consume any key for being transformed. And I understand as it's such late game, it's not really helpful for many people, but I just really want people to know that this exists as it's such a fun thing to use really, really late on. So those are the main tips and tricks I wanted to share with you guys in Dragon Ball Z Kakarot. Before we go though, I will share a few other quick tips with you really, really quickly, just in case you hadn't heard them before. First of all, make sure you go back occasionally and speak with Master Roshi at the Kami House to claim your rewards for the Turtle School Challenges, which I'm sure you've been completing without even realizing as you play on just for defeating enemies and stuff like that. And you can get some pretty decent rewards from this, so just go back there every now and then and claim your rewards. Same goes for Corrin, the cat NPC at the tower. At a certain point in the story, he'll start producing sensory beans for you to go and collect every now and then. You'll get a notification saying you can go back to Corrin's tower and collect more sensory beans. So definitely stack up on these every time you get a chance to, because sensory beans heal 100% of your health, which is really, really good, and they're completely free. If you're anything like me, you've probably never actually opened up the C Encyclopedia. Go ahead and open it up and you should get some D-Meadows as a reward for simply unlocking entries in the C Encyclopedia. And the coolest thing in this game I didn't realize until after I'd already finished the game is that while you're driving around, you can actually go into first person view by pressing the triangle button. Which is pretty cool while you're cruising through the streets with your power jeets in the passenger seat, you know? But anyway, let's wrap this video up guys. As usual, leave in the comments down below if you have any extra tips and tricks you'd like to share with the community. I hope you did find this video helpful. If you did, don't forget that thumbs up button, subscribe for more content coming very soon, and we'll see you next time.